Thank you, Paul, and, and thanks to all the speakers for their very different but uh, thought-provoking uh, uh, statements. I would like to leave you with just two <clears throat> kind of concluding remarks. Uh, first, I would like to point to the different challenges we have in the different parts of the Arctic Ocean. I think that's a very important point. We have uh, here the Northeast Atlantic, and here we have the Northwest Atlantic. And in both these areas, we have already established fishery, uh, more or less fully exploited fish stocks. And we have uh, regional fisheries management organizations, NAFO in the Northwest Atlantic and NIAFC in the Northeast Atlantic, that are responsible for managing high seas fisheries in these areas. Uh, now, the challenges in the Northeast Atlantic, and I think Johan Sigurjonsa mentioned a few of those, I, I think maybe the, the, the new challenge there is the change in migration pattern of fish stocks, especially the pelagic stocks. Uh, obviously, this uh, poses a challenge to research, but not, not, not less to fisheries management. I was in my former life a uh, negotiator of Iceland on mackerel fisheries. It has been a challenge uh, in, in the Northeast Atlantic, and it is difficult enough to uh, negotiate the allocation of quotas between states on stocks, even if they keep their migration patterns more or less stable from one year to the other. It is difficult enough, but it becomes even more difficult if the migration pattern changes, as has been the case in the Northeast Atlantic, where these pelagic stocks have been moving further north and west uh, from, from previous years. So uh, uh, the, the uh, distribution of stocks is a very important uh, criteria when states are negotiating uh, allocation of stocks. And so fluctuations in the migration is, is, a, is a challenge to the negotiators, obviously. Uh, in the Central Arctic Ocean, uh, for comparison, uh, we do not have, in principle, any, uh, any established fishery there, except in some, some parts of the exclusive economic zones. But on this high seas area, the dark blue area, we do not have any fishery, and, and this area is more or less covered with ice. Uh, so, and this area also is not covered by any regional fisheries management organization, except for this small part here, which is part of the Niafk area, the, the yellow area here. So, so this is this important, this, there is an important difference between these parts of the Arctic Ocean and uh, necessary to have in mind. The other point I would like to make is that uh, we do not have a legal gap in the Arctic Ocean. We have the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention that basically provides the legal framework for all the marine zones and all the uses of the oceans including uh, the Arctic. And this applies, for example, to the continental shelf, uh, shipping, and fisheries. When it comes to the uh, future fisheries in the high seas area of the Central Arctic Ocean, there is a further treaty that is particularly important. That is the 1995 UN Fish Stocks Agreement in Icelandic called Uthafsreyði uh, Samningurinn. This agreement uh, provides a legal framework for high seas fisheries. And I'd just like to describe very briefly how that agreement can be applied and should be applied in the Central Arctic Ocean in the future. The objective of the UN Fish Stocks Agreement is the conservation and long-term sustainable use of fish stocks. So with, in other words, if there are fish stocks that can be commercially used, they should be used, but in a sustainable manner. We have something called the precautionary approach that stems from Rio, but was uh, put into the UN Fisters Agreement, which is a very modern environmental agreement. And this approach would suggest that fishing states shall be more cautious when information of, on status of fish stocks is, is uh, uh, lacking. Now, the Central Arctic Ocean is a, is a case in point here, because we do not know so much about what fish stocks there are there, and what is their status. So it would be appropriate uh, then to take interim measures and so states should commit not to engage in fisheries in the high seas area of the Ar Central Arctic Ocean until information on fish stocks there and their status uh, is available. This obviously calls for more scientific research in the area as Johan Sigurjonsson also mentioned. 
Now, there is also under the UN Fisheries Agreement the duty to establish RFMOs, regional fisheries management organizations, in areas where there are none available. Uh, there has been uh, some discussion on the po possibility of extending the NEAF area to cover also Central Atlantic Ocean or to extend the NAFO area to cover it. But I think neither is, is likely to happen. More likely is, uh, is a, a establishment of a new organization to cover the parts of the Central Arctic Ocean that are not already covered by, by NEAFC. Uh, the, it, it seems that most states that have been discussing these issues are willing to take these uh, commitments of, of interim measures, not to uh, fish in the area until we know more about it. It may not be necessary to establish an RFMO unless, uh, until we know whether commercial fishery in the area is possible. But it might be possible to prepare for the establishment of an RFMO so that it could be established very quickly if and when the uh, uh, fishing possibility uh, comes to shore. Uh, and the final question then is, which states should be involved in this process? There has been some discussion and sensitivity about that issue. The five so-called coastal states up in the Central Arctic, Denmark on behalf of Greenland, US, Canada, Russia, and Norway, they have already met and discussed the issue. This classification, however, may be questioned as there are only four states, namely Denmark on behalf of Greenland, Canada, US, and Russia, that have exclusive economic zones adjacent to this high seas area that is not covered by, uh, by, by NEAFC. Norway is to the south of that area, and it may be uh, argued that Norway is not a coastal state with respect to the uncovered area in the high seas of the Central Arctic Ocean. Now, my point is not to say that Norway should not be included in the process, but rather my point would be that it does not make sense to narrow the participation down to four or five states, but rather all the Arctic eight, so also Iceland, Sweden, and Finland should be included in this, in this process uh, in order to, uh, and, and it is quite possible to use the Arctic Council uh, as a, a forum for this uh, work, even though the Arctic Council does not formally have competence on fisheries, in this initial phase it might make sense to make use of the Arctic Council, which has been very successful in reach, reaching agreement in recent years on, on several issues, as you may know. And actually, in order to prevent future overfishing in this area, it would probably also be necessary to include other major uh, fishing entities, uh, both in Europe and in Asia. So this would include the EU and also the uh, Korea, China, and Japan from the Asian side. Uh, now this would, I think, provide for, provide for a, a closure to the issue uh, and be uh, necessary in order to prevent any, any overfishing, any untimely fishing in this in this future area. Now, those were my concluding remarks.